Do I invite you? Yes. Tighten your guns and bubble them. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, this time we want to talk about our own family, the Anglican Church, Anglican Communion, that is propelled and fired by Anglicanism. Uh, earlier when I came, when Bishop uh, David was talking, I read to you some portion from a book I'm carrying in my hands, and um, the portion was simply saying that in the Episcopal Anglican Church is where bishops are human, meaning they are not superhuman, they are not miracle workers, they are human, some of them don't know that they are human, but some of them know, and some of them have wives that remind them that they are human. You know, it's very important to remember that uh, before Reformation, even in the Church of England, clergy were vowed to celibacy. They were not allowed to marry. But thank God after Reformation you could have people who will remind you you are human. Let me just check. When you hear the word Anglican or Anglicanism, what kind of things come to your mind? When you see on a program Anglicanism. What are you expecting? Hey, yes? It is, uh, sorry. Yes. it is part of the rich history and uh, our faith and practice. Good. So you want a bit of history, faith and practice. Good. Uh, what comes to your mind? Anglicanism. <laughs> what comes to your mind? Uh, they are going on after that. A rigid catalogue of do's and don'ts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a rigid catalogue of do's and don'ts. That one I will dismantle today. <laughs> what comes to your mind? <laughs> what comes to your mind? One more, one more before I am a penina. Touch of order which I don't understand, but anyway, we'll talk about it. You think of reformation. Reformation of what? Oh, okay, one more. Yes. Very good. A communion of faith but with a comprehensiveness that combines into one fellowship various strands of Christianity. So, I want to begin by saying my aim here is simply to help you appreciate the, our faith home, the Anglican Church, Anglican Communion, and of course our philosophy has contained in Anglicanism. So all that I will be doing is to help you appreciate the Anglican Church through history and today because I believe as a minister you will minister better when you are confident of your faith home. So my aim is to help you to minister confidently because out there, there are people who misread us and, uh, and uh, what do I want to say? And uh, there is a word I've lost. They misread us and characterize us as a cult. Do you know there are people who know Anglican Church is a cult? 
Yes, so there are people who mislead us and labor. I think labor was, was the word I was losing. Labor has many things, but I want to try to help you understand. I have only one challenge that we are six dioceses here. I have had a chance to speak to three dioceses on Anglicanism. So for some of you, Maseno South, Mabondo, and Maseno West, I may be repeating some things which I have said before. But for Maseno East, Southern Nyanza, and uh, Upper Southern Nyanza, uh, I may have to slow down a bit so that the concept are taken and uh, we move on. As I begin, I want also to say, although two bishops asked to be out, I will be requesting the bishops after this conference to allow me to have a small group of people, maybe one from each diocese, so that we can, in summary, write uh, a manual for us on Anglicanism. Because I find a lot of our Christians have questions which sometimes you have to go back to your notes which you took in college before you can answer. They are good questions, but it takes you to somewhere. So if we can have a manual like this one I'm carrying in my hand, then at the next conference you accept it as the standard of answers we can give, it will be very important. Like if you ask an average Anglican, what do you believe? You will find they are blank. Let me ask Clutch, what do you believe? What do Anglicans believe? What is your faith? Because I know we have no faith statement, but all other evangelical churches have a faith statement. What do you believe? Somebody respond. What do you believe? Yes? We believe, number one, scripture and the creeds. Okay. So that is your faith, eh? What is your faith? What do you believe? What do we believe? And that's why I will want us to summarize and just have a mind more which says for us we believe ABCD. One more. <laughs> I believe in the Trinity. Yes. That is about the Father, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very good. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ. His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by some screen of heaven. You can say the Apostles' Creed of Hell. Yes. Only very few. So you don't even know you are faith. So <laughs> let me just read for you a few things about the Anglican Church before I begin systematic lecture. Number one, and remember what I want to do is to help you to appreciate that you are in the right faith communion. And so I'll be pushing only the good sides, the bad sides I may not talk about. So here this person says, when Anglicanism is at its best, its liturgy, its poetry, its music, and its, and its life can create a world of wonder in which it is very easy to fall in love with God. That our worship creates an environment where it becomes very easy for you to fall in love with God. You remember after uh, the Roman canon Omolo finished, already we were feeling like giving thanks to God. Then when we sang, 
All of us were feeling like I must be born again again. So we create an atmosphere where people may want to fall in love with God again. The next thing I want to read, <laughs> this one I shared with my Seno South people, that um, we have a faith not afraid to reason and a reason not afraid to adore. You can't find that in any other church. Because in many churches you leave your mind at the doorstep as you go into the church. Some other person says here, yes, and this is right Reverend John S. Pong says, the Episcopal or Anglican Church enables me to worship God with my mind. This is the only church that enables you to worship God with your mind, but also uh, secure enough to allow you to adore and uh, continue to honor God in a very special way. So the first question one may want to ask is what is Anglicanism? And I want to say thank you Martin. I want to say that you need to ask yourself what is the Anglican, uh, what is Anglicanism? And we can say this, and maybe those making notes can tell, that it is a distinctive expression of the Christian faith. Anglicanism is a distinctive expression of the Christian faith. Number two, Anglicanism is a particular expression of being church. I will explain that as we go on. Some scholar called Urban T. Holmes says that Anglicanism is a mode of making sense of the experience of God. That we have a special way of understanding the revelation of God and the experience of God. He continues to say that Anglicanism is a unique way of looking at, making sense of, and acting in the experience of God as it is disclosed to us in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Gospel in Anglicanism is summarized in what we call the Paschal Mystery. You know Anglicans need a few heavy vocabulary. Paschal. <laughs> Anglican, gospel in Anglicanism is summarized in the Paschal Mystery which we, we celebrate on Easter. And it runs directly to the core of the theme of this conference. Because the Paschal Mystery says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And that is gospel. For an Anglican, anything that does not highlight that Christ God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself is really not gospel. This Paschal mystery which we celebrate during Easter is the core of the gospel that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and once the world is reconciled then we can say in Christ, 
we are one. That we all may be one. I can call you my brother and I truly mean it because we've been reconciled through the act of Jesus on the cross. Praise the Lord. And you know, we also believe that at baptism, the separation between God and man ends. At baptism, separation between God and man ends. And when you remember your catechism, yes, you will find what did God do, do to you at your baptism. Who can tell me? What did God do to you at your baptism? Catechism, man, person, watch now. What did God to do to you at your baptism? separation between me and God. And it is a sacrament not my doing. So what you need to do is to help this person grow in their salvation which they receive uh, on the day of their baptism. Even though they could not talk but they were saved. Why? Because on the cross Christ paid for all our death. I don't have to have my mind to be saved. I don't have to do anything to be saved. I simply have to be human and accept that Jesus saved me and I'm saved. So for us, <laughs> for us, uh, the gospel is the pastoral mystery and salvation is the act of Christ. It is Christ who saved us. We don't do anything to be saved. And so we need to accept that for us there are some distinctive features of our church that makes us unique. So, in the Catechism again, it is written what is the Anglican communion? And that is simple. It is a worldwide faith, uh, faith communion derived from the Church of England and sharing with it uh, its traditions of faith and order uh, as set forth in the Book of Common Prayer recognizing the Sea of Canterbury as a point of unity. The communion's traditions include attitudes that are Protestant and Catholic, ancient and reformed, liberal and conservative. Our communion has very unique character. And uh, in a short while, I want to give you a history beginning from uh, second century to date. What has formed the Anglican Church you see today, or what has created Anglicanism, started in the British Isles in about two centuries BC by the invasion of uh, the Roman soldiers into the British Isles. So the Roman soldiers about second century came in and uh, let me tell you that there are three major turning points for the Anglican Church 
that has created what we are today. The first one is the origin, and the origin is where the first evangelism was done by Roman soldiers who overcome, overpowered the British Isles. And I want to say, if you are making notes, that the beginning accounts for the mixed character of the Anglican Church. The origin account for the mixed character of the Anglican Church even today. So when the Roman soldiers came, among them there were people from all over the world. They were not only Romans. There were Africans and people from all over who were in that army and the nobles who went to pray. Some came as far as North Africa and a few even uh, interior of Africa. So the first evangelism is done through Roman occupation. Then, after a while, two pagan tribes invaded England, or rather the British Isles. These two pagan uh, tribes were called angels and Saxons. So when they came, they drove away the Romans and Christianity was almost wiped out. But there was still some seed there. Then the second uh, missionary group that was there was connected to North Africa. That is the Celtic group which we call in some history books Britonic Christianity. The Celts, like if you look at my cross, this is not a Petron cross, this is a Celtic cross. So accounting for the mix we see, even among the bishops, if you check their crosses, you will find they don't look alike. That is the mix of the Anglican church which we adore and love. So the Celtic uh, group was mostly in uh, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. And they existed as a very strong mission. Then the third strand was mission that was uh, commissioned by Gregory the Eighth. Gregory the Eighth commissioned Augustine, uh, who came for a mission. Tomorrow I will wear Augustinian cross to tell you Anglican church is rich. You don't have to be dull and monotonous. You can be quite rich and have freedom to adorn a lot of good things that come from our heritage. So the Augustinian mission came in and established the Roman church but in England and Augustine became the first Archbishop of Canterbury and uh, about third century uh, about third century the church in England was mature enough for them to send three bishops to the council at Whitby or Whitby uh, pronunciation can be different so that is the beginning of the Anglican Church accounting for its mix, for its mixed character. And I want you to note that Anglican has a mixed character. Are we there? So that when you see somebody do something different, don't say this is not Anglican. Anglican has a mixed character. And that comes from the origin. The second turning point, which is important for understanding Anglicanism today, we would call separation. 
The first is origin. The second turning point is separation. Separation is to do with reformation that led to the separation having in England a Catholic church without the Pope. So separation right from 14th century BC there were already feelings of anti-papacy in England. People already were feeling they cannot pay allegiance and tribute to a foreign papacy. And uh, therefore in Anglicanism you find the tension between local autonomy and the uh, okay and, uh, and uh, universal authority. Local autonomy and universal authority are always in tension. And that is even within one diocese you realize that once the bishop sends you to a parish he will tell you this is yours and mine but then he cannot come without you inviting him. <laughs> so tension between local authority and, and central power. Yes, between local authority and central power. And we are big enough to live with those tension. And that's why I love the Anglican Church. So separation begins about uh, 14th century, the seed of reformation, and the issues about reformation were they wanted reformation in the order of ministry, reformation in worship, reformation in doctrine, because the medieval doctrines were already being changed, and uh, therefore the seed of reform was in England before the 16th century, but around 14th century, 15th century. So these ideas of reform begins to pick up when now uh, Calvin and Martin Luther and Zwingli and other people come up with their reform doctrines and they greatly influence the people in England, but England was still officially a, a, a Roman church, meaning answerable to the bishop in Rome, the Pope. Then it comes to 16th century, and the ideas of Luther had influenced so many people, including Erasmus, uh, who came to St. Paul's, London, and other people, reform doctrines were flying around. But then there still was no occasion to separate. So it came to a point when King Henry VIII needed a hair and he did not have a hair and he imagined if he divorced his wife, actually he didn't call it divorce, he wanted his marriage nullified. And you know, if you have gone to school, nullity and divorce are two different kinds of things. And uh, so he wanted his marriage nullified, and the Pope refused. Because of that, in Parliament already they were passing laws that they will not answer to a foreign papacy. Then Henry now has an occasion to make the separation official. And so the desire for the hair for Henry was not the cause of separation, but it was an occasion for separation. It was not the cause, but an occasion. Meaning, there were so many causes and people ready to jump into separation. But still, they did not have a proper timing or opportunity. Anglicans like to wait for timing and opportunity. And uh, 
And so, when this uh, man said, okay, to hell with the Pope, the British Parliament quickly sanctioned it because they were ready for it. Motions had been put in and all that, and so the separation was done. But the separation was short-lived because Mary, the Bloody Mary, have you heard of Bloody Mary? Bloody Mary came in and returned England back to the Pope. And so she nullified the separation which was occasioned by the desire uh, for nullity by King Henry VIII. The problem with most Anglicans, they begin their story of separation with what they call the divorce of Henry VIII. That is mediocre, that is not true, it was not the beginning of the separation between England. There were already things brewing and this was a good occasion for them to say, now uh, it is quit, but then, even if um, that was the case, Mary came on the throne and Mary made sure her grandma and other people were burned at stake, the reformers were dealt with thoroughly, and then England was absolved by the Pope. So if you think you are in an adulterous church, you are uh, absolved by the Pope. The Pope absolved King Henry and absolved you, and uh, so you are no longer in an adulterous church. Because I know there are people there who will say, you are welcome to do the naked waro, where you are not called, and you are not called, and you are So let's say it was an occasion, but let's also say Queen Mary came in, returned everybody back to the Pope, and they were absolved. Then came Queen Elizabeth the first. So when King, Queen Elizabeth the first came, she allowed the reform to continue and she worked very hard to get a settlement on religion, the via media, to be able to combine into one fellowship the ideas of Luther and Calvin and the radical reformers and bring them together with the desire to remain connected to the first church, the ancient Catholic and Apostolic Church. So Queen Elizabeth did quite a lot of work to bring the concept of the media to bring comprehensiveness. So, write in your notes that Anglican Church is a comprehensive church. Comprehensiveness meaning we are able to contain in one fellowship two contradicting truths. <laughs> we are able to hold in one fellowship two contradicting uh, truths. Meaning <clears throat> the ideas of the reformers were right. They were taking us to gospel, taking us back to biblical Christianity. The ideas of um, the people who are encouraging issue of, uh, of uh, getting connected to the apostolic church were also very good ideas and we needed to have them in our church. Let me just quote the one time Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, who said these words, and I think they are very, very important. William Temple says this, our special character, and as we believe, 
our peculiar contribution to the universal church arises from the fact that owing to historical circumstances, we have been enabled to combine in one fellowship the tradition of faith of the, the tradition of faith and order of the Catholic Church together with the immediacy of approach to God through Jesus Christ that is more akin to the evangelical churches and to the freedom of intellectual inquiry where the revelation of God and advancing knowledge is constantly being effected. So in the Anglican Church, you're able to follow the faith and order of the Catholic Church. You are also able to approach God directly through Jesus Christ, which is more the uh, evangelical mode of doing things, but you do not leave your, door, your, your mind at the church door. You are able to infuse the, uh, the revelation of God and the advancing knowledge because it is continually being effected. Let me say this. Every man and girl can walk so cannot make it. If you do not read, you cannot make it. Because our enterprise is so uh, complex that if you cannot be able to live up to the, its complexity, you will be working within the Anglican Church but preaching a different, a different religion. And many of us do that. We do not understand the comprehensiveness of quality of the Anglican Church where we are willing uh, to listen. The reason I responded to uh, Venerable Naftali that I will dismantle that notion that there are many don'ts. Let me tell you, scholars, okay. scholars have agreed that in the Anglican Church there are very few don'ts. But we prefer consultation and consensus building. That is how you are here today because these bishops consulted, built consensus, and then you came. There is no archbishop who said everybody must come. But we go for uh, <laughs> consultation and consensus building. The second point which you would read in that book I'm holding uh, is that Anglicans do not prescribe but they suggest how you should respond to God. Meaning I will not force you and say, Isaac, you must repent or you are going to hell. But I say, it may be useful if you uh, self-introspected, looked at your life and then interrogated your Muslim. So that's a difference. We do not force people to respond to God in a particular way. We make suggestions and then the third thing which you may need to write is that we equip. We equip people with enough information to be able to make decisions on how they respond to God. That equipment you will find in our worship services. In the worship service, Anglicans enact the doctrine of, um, uh, of salvation through faith alone. Doctrine of grace. If you open the Anglican prayer book, you begin at the, at the beginning, you will find you are called to worship God. Once you've been called, you are told, if you say you are not a sinner, 
you are deceiving yourself. Then you are moved to a point of accepting that you want the grace of God. Then you move to the next point which tells you go in peace to love and serve the Lord. So the service is preparing you for life on earth, honoring God and serving God. So those are some of the things that we may need uh, to know. And let me say this before I forget. In our liturgy, the Anglican liturgy, what is important is not the form. What is important is the story that the liturgy is telling. Praise the Lord. What is the story our liturgy is telling? Who can tell you here the liturgy of the Anglican Church? What is the story? The form we know, uh, and we will talk about it tomorrow because I would like us to be, uh, to look Anglican when we are gathered together. But what is the story that our liturgy is telling? You people are used to the prayer book, and this is just yes. The story about Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Yes, Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Tell me the story of Jesus. Christians 
who are baptized. And so, in Anglican Church, the role of the minister is to prepare the whole church to do the work of God. The next question I want to ask, what is the basis of authority in Anglicanism? Some of you I'm sure know. What is the basis of authority? Answer me please. Scripture. Yes, I can Isaac. It is the scripture. Scripture, somebody else? Reason. Huh? Reason and tradition. The reason and tradition. And uh, let me say this. Reason is really the opportunity where the Holy Spirit continues to open up for us the will of God. And that is where we were saying that Anglicans do not like immediate closure, but we go for dialectic quest over and against immediate closure and uh, saying this is the end. We are open to God continuing to speak to us through the Holy Spirit and as we reason. Tradition is not tradition Tradition are these are accumulated wisdom of the Holy Spirit during the development of the church or other accumulation of wisdom of the Holy during the development of the church and the Holy Spirit. Meaning, they are not just what you think about. You will find them in the Book of Common Prayer, in the Articles of Religion. You will find them in the Books of Homily. Those are the traditions we are referring to. What are the basic beliefs of Anglicanism? Let me say the basic belief of Anglicanism is Holy Spirit and uh, I mean, uh, Holy Trinity, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We also believe in salvation. Salvation is reconciliation between human beings and God. The, this is the beginning of a new life lived according to God's will through faith in Jesus Christ whose sacrifice was made, uh, who, who sacrifice made salvation possible. So salvation is reconciliation between God and man. And remember, we also believe in sacramental reconciliation. And once you are reconciled, you are on one side with God. What now needs to happen is to grow into that relationship. Number three, that we also believe in um, the creeds, meaning the summary of uh, faith as it is a summary of teaching as it is in the uh, Dominical sacraments. Then we also believe in the church. Anglicans believe that the church is one, is holy, is Catholic, is apostolic, the church is characterized as militant and triumphal. The church is characterized as militant and tri triumphal. Reason I want to pause a little on that is because of um, a challenge which young people have. Quite a number of young people, when we say, I believe in Holy Catholic Church, 
If they had not been taught what that means, it is a contradiction in terms for them. But also, some cheeky Roman Catholic fathers also take the advantage and tell people in the village, Who's a little man? Who say when you are closed in your own cocoons, you don't listen to what happens in the village. But you will find them saying, Ah, this is the only church even Ango can say we believe in Holy Catholic Church. So what does Holy Catholic Church mean? Hey, 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 hey. Mother said the Jamaican Church of all. You only speak when you are asked to. Yes. Catholic means universal. And are you able to convince your people that it is so? Very good. Although for the Lewis they are lucky that when that prayer was being interpreted, Bishop Okulu insisted that we leave out the word Catholic and say Kanisa Marina Sai Mane Pengema. Because he knew the challenge that that was going to bring. We may need to think, even those who use English, to try and put alternative. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, but Slash also say the Universal Church of Christ. Uh, in, in Universal Church of Christ or whatever else you would want to do. So we believe in the church. The number five article of faith for us is worship. Worship. We believe in worship. We believe that you cannot be a Christian if you only watch TV and no, not worship with your fellow believers. It is the worship that helps you to grow into the body of Christ. And so we encourage people to worship together. For Anglicans, worship is an integral part of the life of a believer. A believer who doesn't worship will not go very far. A believer who does not worship will not go very far. So we believe in worship. For us, worship is a joyous response to God's love. Joyous response to God's love. I will leave it for the clergy to find ways of ensuring that our worship services give people room and enough encouragement to be joyful as they respond to God, celebrating salvation and celebrating the grace that they talk about in the service. For us, worship is an expression of hope for salvation. If you find this book, you will find that one of the archbishops was asked, are you saved? Of course, by the enthusiastic evangelist. When I asked him, are you saved? He said, I am saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. That is an Anglican. You are saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. How can we believe that the death of Christ on the cross paid the penalty for sin? And in that score, we are saved from the penalty of sin. But we still live here on earth. Temptation comes, and sometimes we see it in thought word or deed. When we were in school, we had a CEO patron who used to ridicule Anglicans. That Anglicans are miserably sinful. 
Because it is an English we would say, we are miserable offenders, so forgive us. He would say, those are Anglicans who are miserable offenders. But Anglicans, though being miserable offenders, they know how to deal with their sin. So that's why they say, we are being saved from the bondage of sin. When the sin comes, you take it to the cross. So that the sin does not hold you captive. You can be annoyed with your wife or your husband, but you don't stay there. You go to the cross. Your bishop may actually annoy you, but you don't stay there. You go to the cross. You may find you annoy yourself. I don't know whether you have had the experience where you look at something and say, how could I have done such a silly thing? You know, nobody has told you it is silly, but in yourself, you have seen, how could I have been that stupid to do such a thing? We know where to take our problems, the cross of Christ. And so, God continues to save us from the bondage of sin so that we don't some sin. Koro, uh, the, the sin does not ride us as a bicycle or a motorcycle because we are being saved from that. But then we also look forward to being saved from the presence of sin someday. That is Anglican theology on salvation and on sin. You are saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. It is not done, it is continuing, but then it doesn't give you license to just continue sinning willfully. When you sin willfully, you may not have room to repent. You know when you go into something knowingly and you just do it, uh, you may not be convicted to repent so that you may be saved from it. So let's just say if for any reason you fall into any sin, you go back to the cross of Christ. So again it was Archbishop William Temple who said, I am saved, I have been saved, and I will be saved. So we need to, uh, to note that. We know that worship in the Anglican communion is uh, characterized by liturgy and by sacrament and other ordinances. Liturgy, of course, refers to a formal rite for public worship. And there are three central texts to that, uh, of course, you know it's the Bible, the hymn book, and um, and the prayer book. For us, the prayer book puts us through the theology of grace. The prayer book helps us to enact the theology of grace, maybe it's not there. Okay, that's what for me. Okay. Yes, the prayer book helps us to go through the theology of grace. And in every page, you will find that we are talking about our weakness, our limitation, God's power, God's grace, and God's mercy. Let me just caution a little that when you are going to lead a public service that is in church or anywhere else, you need to go through that service every time you are going to do it. Don't be familiar with the holy things. Write that, eh? Don't be 
be familiar with holy things. Because if you are, you hurt some people. When you are too familiar with holy things. Rule number one, read the rubrics of every prayer you are going to make. You know what rubrics are? Read the rubric and master what the rubric says about the prayer. In one place I found where church teachers, of course they have not been taught, were just when they are leading morning prayer, they just go through all the prayers, uh, even the ones which are written Easter only, or uh, during Christmas only, they just read all of them. Meaning they did not read the, the rubric. And I've seen one clergy do the same. <laughs> and I will not tell you where. Uh, but, so let us read the rubrics and follow the order as we have been given. When you do, the service becomes really lively. But remember, it is a joyous response to God's love. So lead it in a way that we lead people to honor God, to praise God, to adore God. And as this commentator was saying, that when we are at our best with our poetry, in our liturgy, with our singing, with our prayers, we create an occasion for people to fall in love with God. And that is the aim of the prayer book that was written by many people and grandma leading them. So we need to know that for us, worship is liturgical and liturgical worship must be conducted well. Don't begin I don't say the Nicene Creed before 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 I go 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 before I go
Oh yes, then I hear my man there. Then I was like, eh? I thank God for that. I thought, no, 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 When we come together, we are just reminding each other on the things we must uphold so that we can be able to serve God in a manner that gives glory to God. Worship to Temeuru. Let's try with all we can to be meticulous in how we conduct our worship services to bring in the theology of grace and bring in the story which is being said uh, which is being told. Let me focus a bit on sacraments. Sacraments are described as outward visible signs. Of course it is the work of grace done by Christ. Outward and visible signs of the inward spiritual grace instituted and ordained by Jesus Christ. These are two which are known as the sacraments of the gospel and they are baptism and holy communion. In Anglicanism, baptism is the gateway to the family of God. Baptism is administered once to each person. For those from Christian families, it is done once as an initiation for infants. In missionary situations or missionary setting, it is adult believers and household baptism. It is also understood as a covenant, covenantal, uh, yes, covenant uh, baptism. In baptism, water is poured on the head of the person, or the person is immersed in water, symbolizing washing away of sin, death and resurrection with Christ, anointing for special relationship with God and special service. The Holy Trinity is called upon to strengthen the new church member. A pledge of repentance and obedience to divine will be Uh, to divine will is made personally or by the sponsor. Baptism is a sign that a person has been reborn into a new family, the church. I will say more tomorrow, but today let me just say that please let us prepare people well for baptism. And preparation should take training. Even if it is a child of one year, prepare the parents, but talk to that child about baptism. The child spiritually will get it. Some of us ignore children, but tell them, tomorrow I will be baptizing you, pouring water on you, meaning you are washed, You are a member of the kingdom and all that. And if you do that, the kid will be very calm during baptism. If you don't do that, you will see what Reverend Edward the saw. I tell them what you saw. Service and we were baptized in children. We were with uh, 
uh, the retired yeah, yeah. canon. Your supervisor. My supervisor. And uh, this was a, a child who had grown about five, six years. And so as we were in the service, as, as we poured water on his, on his head, he ran. Later on, he was brought back. We finished what we were doing. But he went the other side of the holy table and abused us. <laughs> no, the way he abused, please don't, don't, don't worry. We will not repeat, but he abused us in the presence of the congregation. So you begin to imagine, but you ignore and then you move on. Religious orders 
of both women and men. In our situation, we include lay readers, evangelists, who are lay people commissioned and licensed by the bishop to assist the clergy. But then we also encourage priesthood of all believers. I have just run through some of the things that make us what we are, we are. But I left one. I told you that there are three historical turning points. One was origin. See you. Second was separation. The third one which I didn't talk about, which I should end with, is expansion. The Anglican Church, after Reformation in the 16th century, there came Catholic revival in the 17th century and uh, a renaissance of humanism and all that in the 17th and uh, then 18th century there were several revivals, Wesleyan revival, uh, Zwingli's revival and others and these revivals led into lay people forming societies for preaching the gospel. Which are the societies that were there for preaching the gospel? Which societies do we remember? Yes, the Royal Geographical Society and the explorers also preached the gospel like this man, Kraft. Kraft and Redman came to and he was not a colonizer. So when Patrick Lumumba says the Anglican Church was founded by colonizers, he is wrong. It was not colonizers, it was explorers and missionary societies, but a third trend was those who came as chaplains to the governors and colonizers. So when you talk of Anglican Church, you can't put them in one basket and say the colonists came and when we were praying, they were taking the land, the church came much earlier than the colonizers. And for us, we just need to know some of those things so that we can correct them in social media and in various places because we have a mind. We do not have faith without our mind. We engage our mind in our faith and in our action. Let me stop there and I will pick up on ministry tomorrow. God bless you. somebody has a question, just two minutes. I was told to end at uh, one thirty, two minutes. If not, I'll give more time tomorrow for questions and discussion. Thank you.